Our theme tonight, the question that we're asking is, Jesus, man, myth, or God? So I think we're going to have a fantastic evening. Let me just introduce our panelists. Uh, Dr. Shabir Ali is the president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International in Toronto and is the founder of the TV and online show, Let the Quran Speak. Dr. Ali holds uh, an MA and PhD in Islamic Studies from the University of Toronto. Earlier, he competed, uh, completed his BA in Religious Studies from Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, with a specialization in Biblical Literature. He also possesses a Bachelor of Science with a major in Physics. In 2013, he completed his PhD and obtained his doctorate with his thesis being on uh, uh, Quranic exegesis. Dr. Ali is a longtime active member of the Muslim community in Toronto where he regularly speaks on Islam and comparative religion. In addition to that, much like this evening, he is an active participant in interfaith dialogues and initiatives in Canada and uh, also abroad. He's the author of numerous books on Islam and the Abrahamic faiths. Some of his titles is, is Jesus God? The Bible says no. What God said about eating pork? and science in the Quran, and in addition to many others. And he has recently taught courses on Arabic in the Quran and Islam at the University of Toronto. Welcome, Dr. Ali. Our next panelist is Dr. Andy Bannister. Dr. Bannister is the director of the Sola Center for Public Christianity and an adjunct speaker for Ravi Zachariah International Ministries. He is also an adjunct research fellow at the Arthur Jeffrey Center for the Study of Islam at the Melbourne School of Theology. He holds a PhD in Islamic Studies from Brunel University, London, and has taught at universities across Canada, the USA, and uh, further afield on both Islam and philosophy. And Dr. Banner also has published a number of books. An oral formulaic study of the Quran, and that one delves into the composition of the Quran. Uh, Heroes, five lessons from whose lives we can learn. In that uh, work, Dr. Bannister looked at the lives of Newton, Wilberforce, C.S. Lewis, Newbegin, and Tim Keller. And the atheist who didn't exist for the dreadful consequences, or the dreadful consequences of really bad arguments. And he co-wrote and presented the TV documentary, Burning Questions. He's described himself as a keen hiker, mountain climber, I've got to know that a little bit better in the last few days, and photographer. He is married to Astrid and they have two children, uh, Katrina and Christopher. And uh, Dr. Bannister also enjoys addressing audiences, both Christian and those of all faiths, and uh, those who say they possess no faith, uh, on issues relating to faith, culture, politics, and society. So welcome, Dr. Bannister. Thank you all for that warm welcome. Thank you, Dr. Fallon, for that generous uh, introduction. Uh, thank you, Andy, for uh, sharing the platform uh, with me. I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and I ask him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets, his messengers, all of the righteous people of all time, on all of us here tonight, and all of our loved ones, and I ask him to bless the entire world, and uh, to help those who are hungry and uh, without shelter, to provide for them, and uh, to save uh, our world and its people from all kinds of disaster and uh, sickness and uh, distress. Now, for our topic tonight, uh, I, I want to uh, say that Muslims and Christians together make up about half of the world's population. So if we can work together uh, to make our world a better place, what a better place it would be. Uh, one of the things that uh, separate Muslims and Christians is uh, our belief regarding uh, who exactly is God. And so our question tonight is very relevant uh, to uh, that, uh, and very germane to bringing Muslims and Christians together. The question is, uh, man, myth, or God? Who, who was Jesus? I want to say first uh, that uh, we, we agree that Jesus was a man. And uh, of course, some of our Christian friends may be surprised to hear that Christians do affirm that uh, Jesus was a man. And that affirmation comes uh, right out of John's Gospel in chapter 7, verse number 40, uh, where uh, uh, chapter 8, rather, verse number 40, where Jesus says, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told 
told you the truth that I heard from God. So Muslims and Christians are in agreement, regardless of uh, whatever else we say about Jesus, we affirm that he was a man. Uh, on the Muslim side, we affirm that Jesus was uh, a word from God, a spirit from God, he was God's Messiah, one of the greatest messengers of God, he performed many miraculous deeds, he healed the leper, cured the blind, raised the dead back to life, uh, but uh, at the end we assert that he was a man. Um, as for our Christian friends, uh, despite the belief that Jesus was uh, fully God, uh, Christians add that he was also fully man, and hence he was a man, and, and we agree on that. Uh, as for the second uh, question, was he a myth? I take this in the uh, popular meaning of, uh, uh, of myth, meaning something that is contra-historical. And uh, I would affirm that uh, Jesus, for Muslims, was not a myth. Uh, he, he was not contra-historical. Muslims believe in him to be an actual person in history. And so do our Christian friends as well. And there's another meaning of myth in the academic circles, which uh, to deconstruct now would uh, require some time. And uh, we'll see if time permits, we can deal with that tonight. Otherwise, we leave that for another occasion. Uh, so we do agree as well, as Muslims and Christians, that Jesus was an actual historical person, and uh, therefore not a myth in that popular sense of the term. As for the third question, this is where I'd like to uh, devote the bulk of my time, uh, because here is where Muslims and Christians are divided. Uh, our Christian friends say that Jesus was fully God, and uh, Muslims uh, would insist that uh, there was only one God, uh, the one whom Jesus actually worshipped. So I would appeal to our Christian friends friends tonight to look carefully at the Bible and to realize that the Bible does not actually justify the claim that Jesus is God in the sense of the Almighty God. Let me differentiate between a few positions uh, so that we can get more into the uh, heat of this discussion. Um, think about our Jehovah's Witnesses friends. They believe that Jesus was a sort of God, a God, but not the Almighty God. So they would look at John chapter 1 verse number 1 where it says in the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and they were translated, and the Word was a God, and they have a sort of grammatical justification for that uh, translation. Whether that is justified or not, uh, it's not my, my, my stopping point at the moment. My point is simply that here is a Christian belief that Jesus is a sort of God, but not the Almighty God. We need to recognize that when we speak about the Almighty God, we are speaking about that incomparable being. He Beyond, with nothing, beyond which nothing greater can be conceived. Now, if, if there is someone who is lesser uh, than him, or if he is greater than someone else, then that someone else obviously is not God. And we have in John chapter 14, verse number 28, that Jesus himself says, my father is greater than I. So when he's referring to God as someone greater than himself, he being the lesser, obviously is not that beyond which nothing greater can be conceived, and therefore he is not the almighty God, regardless whatever else we might say about him. Now, uh, the, the Arian controversy in the fourth uh, century was precisely about this point. Is Jesus uh, a sort of God, a sort of divine being, but not the Almighty God, or is he, as he would be declared in the Council of Nicaea, uh, very God of very God? So we have two sides of this, and Jehovah's Witnesses have picked up again on that uh, Arian uh, formula of saying that Jesus was a sort of divine being, but not the Almighty God. Now, if we say that Jesus was uh, the Almighty God, we, we run into some difficulties of uh, trying to reconcile that uh, with the, the obvious declaration throughout the Bible that there is only one God. Now, we have to find a way to conceive of Jesus and the Father as being together as only one God, while Jesus is God and the Father is God at the same time. Now, the oneness Pentecostalists uh, have their own way of working this out. To them, uh, the Father came down here on the earth, so it, it is the same one person that one individual who, who you might refer to as Father and as Son, and, and also as Holy Spirit in various modes of his uh, existence or appearance. Now this goes back to a very ancient uh, creed as well uh, that uh, was uh, known to be that of a person named Sabellius, and so the creed is called Sabellianism, uh, the belief uh, that God goes through different modes of existence, and it is also called modalism for the very same 
uh, reason. Trinitarian Christians reject that. Tr the Trinity holds that there are three uh, eternal persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the three are one. So there is one God substance, uh, Christian theologians have decided to say, uh, but there are three persons that share that one God substance. So there are not three gods, there are three persons. The Father is a person, the Holy Spirit is a person, the Son is a person. Uh, each is a person, and each one of these persons is God, and yet there is only one God, because the Christian theologians assure us there is only one God substance. But now, to maintain uh, the, the belief that there is on, this only one God substance and the three persons who each is to be called God, uh, this is very difficult in, in practice. And one tends to fall uh, into heresy uh, in, in one way or another in trying to maintain this uh, uh, belief. Uh, and so, let me show you a couple of books. We have a book entitled uh, The Trinity and subtitled How Not to Be a Heretic by Stephen uh, Bullivant. Uh, what, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, the, the, the title is very telling, it's a subtitle in fact. Uh, Stephen Bullivant wrote this book to, to help Christians to speak of the Trinity in the right way. Uh, because if you don't speak about it precisely in the right way, you fall, it's like walking a tightrope. You either fall into heresy on this side or on the other side. What happens is that if if you emphasize uh, the distinctiveness of the three persons too much, then you make them into three gods. You fall into the heresy of tritheism. And if you de-emphasize the distinctiveness of the three persons, then in the end it seems like you only have one person and you have fallen back into Sabellianism or modalism and, uh, as, as is now represented in the Oneness Pentecostalist uh, uh, Church. Another book uh, along the same lines is uh, The Forgotten Trinity by my good friend uh, James R. White. Now James uh, White speaks about uh, the, the heresy that uh, the, the average well-meaning Christian may fall into. Like for example, when, when somebody speaks as though uh, God goes through uh, three different appearances as someone might do in a play, putting on one mask to represent one role as they did in ancient times and then putting on another mask to represent a different role, uh, the same actor but three different uh, appearances. Uh, now uh, obviously what uh, James wants to, to assure us about is that in the Trinity there are actually three actors, but of course there are three actors who share the one God substance. There are three uh, persons. And to emphasize it further, uh, James is uh, telling us that the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Father. Neither are any of these the Holy Spirit. Each one is distinct by him himself. Uh, often, in a gathering like this, uh, I have found that a Christian would stand up to ask a question and uh, if they actually want to convince me that uh, the, the, there is a logic behind the Trinity. And they would say, well, you know, it's like me. I am a, I am a father. I'm also a son. I'm also a husband. So here I have three different roles. Well, putting it that way is falling back into Sabellianism and to modalism because that's the one person in three different social social roles. That's like Jesus himself having different social roles. He is a friend, he's a brother, he's the son of his mother. So he has different social roles, but he's one person. Uh, but that's not the Trinity. Uh, the classical definition of the Trinity says uh, not that there are three social roles, but that there are three persons, each of whom might have uh, different social and, uh, and economic functions. So one falls into these heresies one uh, way or, or, or another. Uh, another problem was pointed out by Peter of uh, Callinicum um, in, in, in the 5th century, who wrote a book about this, and the book has recently been uh, republished uh, for our education. Uh, he charged that uh, Christians are falling into um, another sort of heresy, which uh, involves a fourth God. Now if you think about it, you have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Spirit, and each one by themselves as God. What about the combination, the three of them together? Now, 
Uh, if we think of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, each is powerful by himself or herself, but when they work together as a team, the team is obviously more powerful uh, than, than the individuals uh, by themselves. So uh, Peter of Kalinikum is asking, when Christians think about the, the Godhead and then the three persons that share the Godhead, isn't the Godhead greater than, than any one of the persons by themselves? And do you not, in fact, end up thinking of really four entities, the three persons? persons plus the Godhead. Uh, so it, 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 this is a difficult concept, the Trinity. But uh, I, I want to appeal to our Christian friends and say that if you, if you go back to the Bible itself, you will realize that the Bible does not actually support the belief in the Trinity. Uh, the Bible actually supports more Arianism as it is, as the Bible is now. In that you will find passages which depict Jesus as Son of God, uh, as the Word of God, uh, as a being between God and man, uh, through whom God created created the universe, uh, but not as the Almighty God himself. It, it, in the very statement, uh, the, the, the intermediary being through whom God created the universe, we're talking about God as being someone else other than Jesus, who is shown to be this intermediary being. Now, not all of the documents of the New Testament present Jesus in the same way. Uh, the earliest of the Gospels, the Gospel according to Mark, shows Jesus to have many uh, important limitations. Limitations in his knowledge, limitations in his power. And uh, when people responded to him, they obviously did not take him to, to be the Almighty God. But we will see in, in later documents, later Gospels, uh, Matthew and Luke, for example, and especially the Gospel according to John, uh, we see a much more developed theology in which Jesus is represented as that intermediary being. So we have, for example, in John's Gospel, for the first time among the Gospels, uh, the mention of Jesus as the Word of God, through whom God made everything else. Uh, this concept was not there in the previous Gospels. The title, the Word of God is only in the Gospel according to John. So how did that happen? Imagine Jesus on the scene and Jesus was uh, teaching people uh, about himself. Well, naturally he would tell them, I am the Word of God, if he was the Word of God. And, and that would be one of the most important statements Jesus would have, been, would have made ever. And all of the writers would want to write the same thing. But that is not what uh, the, the other three Gospel writers wrote. It is only John who picked this up. And John is said to be written late in the first uh, century century. And uh, as Dr. James White uh, points out, well, John would have had a long time to reflect not only on what Jesus said, but on what he meant. And many uh, writers uh, excuse the gospel according to John uh, on this basis, that because it was written late, it came after a long period of reflection. But I would say a long period of development um, in the f if centuries after Jesus uh, had been taken away from the scene. Uh, Christians continued to think about Jesus, preach about him, and uh, to develop develop a theology about him away from what Jesus actually taught. But that is not so much my point. My point is still that even if you take the, the documents as they are, even John with his full development as it is, John does not present Jesus as being the almighty God. Uh, John for, uh, chapter 17 verse number 3 has Jesus looking up into heaven and praying and saying this is eternal life that they may know you as the only true God and Jesus your messenger as Christ. Uh, in, in fact, apart from uh, referring to Jesus as father, th th this is a, a very um, uh, Muslim thing to say. Uh, the one Jesus was speaking to is the only true God, and Jesus is to be recognized as God's Christ, or Messiah, or in the Arabic, Al-Masih, as is mentioned in the Quran in chapter 3, verse number 42, and in many other passages uh, of, of the Quran. Uh, we go to Paul's writings, and people refer to the Carmen Christi in, in Philippians chapter 2 to say that Paul uh, took Jesus to be God. But what Paul is saying there has to be bracketed within the rest of the Pauline writings, uh, and even in Philippians itself. Now normally, Paul uh, begins his letters with doxologies in which he is praising God, who he says is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a God who is the Father, and yes, there is our Lord Jesus Christ, but he is not the one who Paul is calling God. Even in Philippians, if we're looking at chapter 2 and you want to interpret it uh, in that way, look at the problems you encounter. Philippians uh, chapter 1 starts with the same 
same doxology, giving glory to God the Father and distinguishing God the Father from Jesus Christ, who is not called God. And uh, in, in uh, the, the same book of Philippians ends in the same way, with, uh, with Paul distinguishing between God the Father and Jesus Christ. What is more important is that uh, in, if that was Philippians chapter 2, in which we have the Carmen Christi, in chapter 3, uh, Paul declares that we worship God the Father. So it's clear whom he worships. So Philippians chapter 2 cannot be understood to mean that Paul is calling on Christians to worship Jesus. No. In fact, what he's saying basically is that Jesus was in the form of God. And what that means needs to be unpacked. Because God, in fact, does not have any form. He's not saying that Jesus was God. But he was uh, something maybe of a, in, in some kind of a divine form. That's the best way of explaining what Paul was saying. Jesus then, instead of trying to go higher than he already was... He chose to come lower as a man, and then lower still by, by allowing himself to be crucified. And then as a result of him coming lower, God lifted him up higher and granted him a name that, that is greater than he had before. It's a lesson in humility. If you come down from the position that you already have, God will lift you up to a higher position than you already have. So for him to be lifted up to a higher position than he already had, that means that he was not God to begin with. And then, of course, he does not ever become God because Paul begins and ends the same letter uh, with the same doxology. And he confesses in the next chapter that he only worships God. And, and God the Father is what he's referring to there. So what does it mean that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow? Well, let me uh, add a, a point here from Muslim uh, practice. There are verses of the Quran which, when we recite them or hear them, uh, we fall on our knees, we, we fall prostrate, but we are praising God. So we fall prostrate to the glory of God. We don't worship the verses, but the verses remind us of God, and we prostrate. So Paul seems to be saying something similar. At the mention of Jesus' name, uh, uh, Christians will fall on their knees they will uh, to the glory of God but that does not mean that Jesus is being regarded as God a similar expression is found in Philippians chapter 1 where the glory of God is to be given by Christians through Christ it's not that Christ himself is the end point and, and that Christ himself is the God I believe I'm getting close to, to my time here how much time do I have <laughs> One minute. I, I'm almost sorry that I asked. You know, she might have fallen asleep. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, to be fair, let me wrap it up then and say uh, that in short, there has been a development where Jesus has, through the centuries, even through the Gospels we can see, has been made uh, from a man into a divine being, a, 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 an intermediary between man and God through whom God created the entire universe. But still, uh, he has not been made into God in the Gospels or in the Pauline writings or anywhere in the New Testament. The New Testament continues to affirm that there is only one God and he's not Jesus. Now, if our Christian friends can come to this belief that there is only one God who is not Jesus, but the one who you refer to as the Father of your Lord Jesus Christ, that will bring Christians and Muslims close together in harmony and we can work better together uh, to achieve greater things uh, for the world. If one refuses to come to that position, one walks on the tightrope of the Trinity with the possibility of always falling into heresy on this side of the rope or on the other side. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, good evening. It's uh, fantastic to be with you here again for another evening at McMaster University for this uh, Veritas Forum. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone involved uh, for this evening, making it possible, and also for Shabir uh, for taking part in tonight's event. And actually, it's the third uh, dialogue uh, that he and I have done together. Now, tonight's topic is a crucial one. Jesus, man, myth, or God. In short, who was Jesus of Nazareth? That was actually the question that Jesus uh, liked to ask people himself. Now, let's begin by talking about myth for a few moments. Although no serious credentialed historian at any university anywhere uh, believes that Jesus is a myth, some contemporary atheist writers have tried to uh, leap into fantasy and erase Jesus from history. So, for example, the French atheist writer Michael Onfray writes, Jesus' existence has never been historically established. 
Problem with that position is that uh, no serious historian takes that seriously uh, in the same way that no scientist takes flat earth theory uh, seriously. Don't take my word for it. Take the words of historian and uh, atheist Bart Ehrman, who writes, I'm not a Christian. I have no interest in promoting a Christian cause or a Christian agenda. But as a historian, I think that evidence matters and the past matters. And for anyone to whom both evidence and the past matter, a dispassionate consideration of the case makes it quite plain. Jesus did exist. But while the Jesus of, of history, the Jesus of the Gospels, is not a myth, some constructions of Jesus are mythic. For example, the Jesus of the Quran uh, is clearly a myth. A number of reasons I say that. First, there is the time gap problem. Uh, Muhammad orally preached and retold the uh, material uh, in what became the Quran, thousands of miles and 600 years removed from Jesus' life. And thus, it's no surprise that the Quran contains none of the evidence of eyewitness testimony we see in the Gospels. Secondly, the Jesus of the Quran is a polemicized Jesus, the Quran's main interest being not history, but sectarian interreligious polemic. Uh, the Muslim scholar Tarif Khalidi of Cambridge University wrote, he said, in sum, the Quranic Jesus, unlike any prophet, is embroiled in polemic. He said the Quranic Jesus is in fact an argument addressed to his more wayward followers. And he said the Islamic Jesus of the Muslim gospel may be a fabrication. He is endowed with attributes that render him meta-historical. And then thirdly, uh, the Jesus of the Quran is largely built on uh, later myths and legends that by Muhammad's time had grown up around Jesus and were whirling around the oral culture in Arabia, leaving poor Muhammad no way to tell truth from fiction. In fact, even the pagans of Arabia could spot legends better than Muhammad could if you look at the accusations in the Quran. Interestingly, Shabir himself, to his credit, has admitted this in a video debate two years ago. Uh, he said of these many legends and fables retold by the Quran, especially around Jesus, Shabir said, the Quran is not here to teach people history. The Quran is calling people back to God with these stories, with these myths and these fables. Yet for all of that, Jesus so clearly fascinated Muhammad, as uh, Shabir reminded us, that he included more material about him in the Quran than uh, any other prophet, almost any other prophet, and used incredibly lofty titles uh, for Jesus. Furthermore, Muhammad had an incredible respect for the life of Jesus, for the gospel, when you use semantic field analysis, which is when you look at which words cohere in a text with other words, we show that we can see using linguistic analysis that the Quran is incredibly positive about the Gospels. But all that said, if we want to know what Jesus thought and what the Jesus of history believed, we need to leave the time of the Quran behind and travel back down through the centuries. We're going to begin our little historical journey uh, this evening in AD 112 where in Bithynia, in modern-day Turkey, the Roman governor, Pliny the Younger, was having trouble with Christians in his province who would not worship the emperor. Pliny wrote to the emperor Trajan for advice, and the letter that's been preserved gives a fascinating snapshot of how Christians uh, in the uh, beginning of the second century were seen. Pliny remarks that Christians were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a god. Now, Pliny's letter shows us that within 80 years of the crucifixion and the resurrection, not merely has Christianity spread widely in the Roman Empire, but that Christians are hallmarked by their worship of Jesus. Now, this is fascinating because Christianity began, of course, as an offshoot of Judaism. And the first Christians were largely Jewish. And in Second Temple Judaism, it was worship that demarcated God from non-God. For Jews, it was very simple. Uh, God was the creator of all things. He was the ruler of all things. And because of that, he was due worship. Uh, Professor Richard Borkham writes these words. He says, in Jewish monotheism, monolatry, the exclusive worship of the one God, most clearly signaled the distinction between God and all other reality. God must be worshiped, no other being may be worshiped. So maybe this worship that Pliny described for us was a mutation in early Christianity as it transitioned from a largely Jewish to a, to a Gentile audience. Well, no, because every, virtually every group of early Christians we know of in the historical record worshipped Jesus. 
But even more significantly, as we dive down through history, beginning with the later documents and moving into the earlier, we actually see in the New Testament documents that are thoroughly Jewish and their theology and their thinking, we see them universally include Jesus in the identity of God through worship. Let me give you three examples as we delve down through history. Beginning at the end of the Bible, in Revelation 22, verse 13, Jesus is reported as saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. This very closely parallels identical language used about Yahweh, about God, in Isaiah 44, verse 6. Revelation also portrays Jesus as a lamb standing on the very throne of God, receiving universal worship. We go a little bit earlier. We come to Hebrews chapter 1, uh, where we see Jesus portrayed as receiving the worship of angels. And then we dive into uh, Philippians chapter 2, where we have recorded an incredibly early Christian hymn where Jesus is portrayed as receiving worship and adoration. What Shabir sadly missed was that passage takes one of the most monotheistic verses from the Old Testament, Isaiah 45, 23, applies words that Isaiah applied to Yahweh and applies them directly to Jesus. The hymn is saying that that universal worship at the end of time that Isaiah imagines uh, and for looks forward to is coming true when all the world worship Jesus. And quite literally, every New Testament document, from the latest down, 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 through the earliest, contains similar themes. It's also noteworthy uh, that throughout the New Testament and all across early Christianity, we see other examples of this. We see Christians calling on the name of the Lord. In the Old Testament, that phrase applies to God. It applies to Yahweh. In the New Testament, it applies to Jesus. Christians baptize in the name of Jesus. Baptism was the entry right into the Christian faith, and it was thoroughly Christocentric in every New Testament document. We find that the name of Jesus is evoked in prayer. It's invoked in casting out evil spirits. Interestingly, we have this little vignette in Acts chapter 16, where we discover Jewish exorcists beginning to copy the Christians and use Jesus' name in exorcism because it's efficacious. And we find Jesus' name used because of its power in healing. In short, all across the New Testament and all across early Christianity, we see Christians using Jesus' name in the way that God's name was used in Second Temple Judaism. And we see Jesus receiving the kind of, same kind of divine worship uniquely directed to God in the Old Testament. Now, if you remember, a few moments ago, I said to you the reason that Second Temple Jews only worshipped God was they believed that God was exclusively the creator of all things and the ruler of all things. In Judaism, that was God's role uniquely. And thus many scholars who have studied this have remarked how, un, how, how striking it is that the New Testament applies those same categories to Jesus. Dozens of times, Jesus is described as being over all things. And similarly, numerous New Testament passages uh, describe Jesus' role uh, in creation. Now, if that were not remarkable enough, it gets even more remarkable, because back in Philippians 2, verse 9, we, we discover that Jesus was also given the divine name. Most commentators on this passage say that the name that is above every other name, to every Jew would know what that was. That was Yahweh, the divine name. And then in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, we discover that passage quotes one of the mon most monotheistic uh, formulas in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the Shema prayed every day by faithful Jews and the New Testament takes that splits it in two and inserts Jesus right into the middle of it now the same pattern as we go down through the historical layers occurs in the Gospels and in Acts. So in John 12 verse 41, Jesus is directly identified with the Lord who Isaiah saw enthroned on the throne in the temple and in the heavenly vision. In Mark chapter 1, Shabir mentioned Mark. Actually, Mark has one of the highest Christologies in the Gospels because in the very first chapter of the, uh, this, the earliest of our Gospels, almost the very first line, a prophecy from the Old Testament about a way being prepared in the wilderness for Yahweh to return to his people is quoted and it's applied directly to Jesus. 
And then also, in the book of Acts, uh, on the day of Pentecost, we read how it is Jesus who pours out the, Holy, the promised Holy Spirit, promised in the Old Testament in Joel 2, verse 28, where uh, we see Jesus doing what God said he would do. As Max Turner, one of the experts on uh, the role of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, writes, he says, that step from recognition of Jesus with the Father as the source of charis martyr of, uh, of the Holy Spirit, uh, to some sort of recognition of his share in God's divine lordship would have been a very short step, precisely because Judaism made the spirit so exclusively God's own influence. In short, the New Testament, on every level and every document, consistently portrays Jesus doing what God in the Old Testament said that he would do. And of course, that includes a particular role, includes saving his people. In the Old Testament, it is God alone who is uh, the saviour, according to over 40 different verses. But in the New Testament, it is Jesus who has taken on that salvific role. For the Old Testament, the story of God's saving action in history, told hundreds of times, is the story of the Exodus, alluded to again and again. In the New Testament, it becomes the cross of Jesus Christ, and of course, Jesus directly connects those two salvation events in the Last Supper, jamming them together. So across history, every early Christian group that we know of, down through every level of the New Testament, from the latest to the earliest, Jesus is included in the divine identity. This happens fast, it happens early, and it happens in thoroughly Jewish categories. As Professor Martin Hengel, considered by many to be the finest biblical scholar of the 20th century, wrote, he said the time between the death of Jesus and the fully developed Christology which we find in the earliest Christian documents is so short that the development that takes place can only be called amazing. Which raises, ladies and gentlemen, a question. We really have only two answers here. Where did this come from? Either it goes back to Jesus himself, or he was an utter failure because nobody understood him. As Professor Larry Hurtado puts it, if Jesus intended no special role for himself in their religious life, he, was, he would have had to be seen as spectacularly unsuccessful in communicating that intention to his followers. I want to suggest to you that the best explanation is all of this that I've just mapped out to you in this historical analysis goes back to Jesus. And I want to share with you seven, if we had time I could give you 50, but I'm going to share with you seven pieces of data that just taken together, not individually, but together, show that Jesus, uh, who Jesus thought that he was. So, number one. First, there was Jesus' attitude to the Old Testament. In the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere, Jesus frequently says things like, you have heard that it was said. Then he quotes the Torah, and then he proceeds to put his own words on a par with or above the Torah. I say to you, commenting on this, Rabbi Jacob Neusner, one of the most well-regarded of Jewish scholars, remarked this. He said, Jesus' attitude to Torah makes me want to ask him, who do you think you are, God? That from a Jewish writer. Second, Jesus believed that he had the authority to forgive sin. We see that in Mark chapter 2, for instance. Now, the problem here isn't simply that forgiving sin is God's prerogative. The problem is that Judaism had a place for forgiveness. It was called the temple. If you sinned, you went to the temple, you gave your sacrifice, job done. Jesus, though, short-circuits that whole process. As Professor N.T. Wright of St. Andrews University in my native Scotland writes, he says Judaism had two great incarnational symbols, temple and Torah. Jesus seems to have believed that it was his vocation to upstage the one and outflank the other. Thirdly, there is Jesus' attitude to his own name. Multiple times, Jesus introduces his teaching not by saying the Lord says, but I say to you. He taught his followers to pray in his name, to ask for things in his name. As Raymond Brown uh, famously put, once put it, he said, the idea that Jesus was divine, I find on most gospel pages. Any attempt to lessen the self-evaluation of Jesus to something like he thought he was only a prophet would, in my judgment, involve proving the gospels a misunderstood Jesus. No Old Testament prophet acted in such independence of the Mosaic law. And it is remarkable that one never finds in reference to Jesus a prophetic formula such as the word of God came to Jesus of Nazareth. 
fourthly, thank you, Jesus interpreted his miracles as authority claims. There are lots of examples. One quick one for you. In Luke chapter 11, verse 20, after casting out a demon, Jesus says it is by the finger of God that he performs exorcisms. That is fascinating because in the Old Testament, the finger of God is a phrase used exclusively to talk about God acting directly, specifically when God writes on the tablets of stone uh, for Moses. Very, very lofty claim. Fifthly, on many occasions, Jesus identifies himself as divine wisdom. In the Old Testament, wisdom is the kind of personification of Yahweh, of God's uh, role and action in creation. And Jesus takes that language and applies it to himself. As Professor Ben Witherington, who has written a magisterial study on this theme, writes, he said, if it is true that Jesus made a claim that something greater than Solomon was present in and through his ministry, one must ask what it could be. Surely the most straightforward answer would be that wisdom had come in person. Sixthly, Jesus' favorite title for himself was Son of Man, a title he actually took from Daniel chapter 7, where we read of one like a son of man enthroned beside God in heaven. Interestingly, in his trial before, Caesar, before Caiaphas, the high priest, Jesus quotes Daniel 7 at Caiaphas, to which Caiaphas responds, blasphemy, and sends Jesus away to be executed. He knew full well what that claim meant. And then seventh, just for tonight, Jesus declares himself in Mark 2 verse 28 to be Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was central to Judaism and faithful Jews believed the Sabbath was sacred time. The Sabbath was something God had set up, that was why it was sacred, and it demonstrated that Yahweh was, ruler, was Lord of time. The very fact that Jesus says that, it is tantamount to Jesus saying, I, Jesus, am actually the one who is over time and space and so forth. Elsewhere in the Gospels, actually, in John chapter 5, we see it was this very attitude to Sabbath that was one of the factors that led to Jesus being arrested on charges of blasphemy me. So as we look at all of this, we find ourselves thinking, you know, no wonder that people asked, who is this man? Either he was arrogant beyond belief, or we are forced to grapple with the fact that he was who he claimed to be. And when, of course, three days after his crucifixion, Jesus rose physically and bodily from the dead, his followers quite rightly took that to be vindication that everything he had said was true. And then immediately, and throughout every page of the New Testament and throughout the whole of Christian history that we can study as historians, Christians began to worship Jesus, including him in the identity of the God of the Bible and doing so in thoroughly Jewish ways. As Richard Borkham remarks, the highest possible Christology, the highest possible Christology, the inclusion of Jesus in the unique divine identity was central to the faith of the early church even before any of the New Testament documents were written, since it occurs in all of them. The New Testament writers did not see their Jewish monotheistic heritage as a problem. Rather, they saw they used its resources extensively in order precisely to include Jesus in the divine identity. So in closing, why does any of this matter? Well, it matters because Jesus' ministry was about revealing God to us. You know, many people throw the word God around quite loosely and quite lightly, but not all conceptions of God are the same. And when people ask, is Jesus God, what they often do is bring along their own understanding of who God is and then try and squeeze Jesus into it. With all due respect, that's what Shabir has done this evening. Why is that problematic? Well, let me leave you with once again with N.T. Wright of St. Andrews University, who writes these words. If you start with a kind of absent landlord kind of God, or the God of deism, or I might add the God of Islam, or one of the New Age gods, or even one of the gods of ancient paganism, and you ask, what would happen if such a God were to become human? You would end up with a figure very, very different from the one in the Gospels. But if you start with the God of Genesis, the God of the Exodus, the God of creation and covenant, the God of Isaiah, the God of the Psalms, and you ask what that God might look like were he to become human, you will find that he might look very, very like Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you for listening. Okay. Um.
So for my, for my first question, uh, Andy, is that uh, you, you mentioned that Mark uh, chapter 1 has uh, um, Jesus identified with Yahweh, uh, but uh, in the rest of Mark's gospel, um, what you seem to have missed is that Mark presents Jesus uh, as uh, having limitations in his knowledge and his power. For example, Mark chapter 13, verse 32, Jesus says of that uh, hour no one knows, not even the Son. Uh, so if he does not know something that the Father knows, doesn't that uh, mean that he is not the omniscient God? That's a great question, and I'm really glad you went to... Give, give me the reference again, Shabir. Chapter 13, Mark verse 32. 13, 32. I left my Bible in the car, and so I'm borrowing somebody else's. Yeah, what's really, what's really interesting, I'd say a couple of things here. I think one of the... That point where I ended is really important. Because I think one of the things that, that Muslims sometimes do, with all respect, and I'm gonna, I'll ask you about this when it comes to my turn at questioning, is that you take a conception of God that you already have from elsewhere, and then you sort of try and squeeze it back into the Gospels. And when things don't fit, you go, oh, well, hang on, there's a problem. Rather than trying to allow, what is the picture that the Gospels is actually trying, trying to paint? And what's really interesting, Mark, of course, if you, if you read Mark carefully, and don't just read, lift verses out of context, read the whole of the Gospel, read the whole of the Gospel of Mark, it's very carefully constructed. Mark begins with this great vision of Jesus is the, is the one in whom Yahweh's return to his people is embodied. If you remember, 400 years before Jesus came, the Old Testament closes with the book of Malachi. And there's been this great long period of silence. Books like Isaiah and others are looking forward to when Yahweh will one day come back to his people. And Mark is picking up on that imagery and going, hey, look, here's John preparing the way. And Jewish readers are going, wow, who's going to come down the way? And of course, here's Jesus. Then, you be, then the whole of Mark's gospel is set up to make you ask, who is this man? Who is this man who the wind and the waves obey him? The disciples ask that. Who is this man who forgives sin? Who is this man? And of course, right bang in the middle of Mark's gospel, we have Mark 8, 29, where Jesus looks at his followers and say, who do you say that I am? And then right at the very end, the centurion, the Roman centurion at the cross, is the one who announces this truly was the son of God. Interesting Interestingly, his words there almost paralleling the words of, of, of God from heaven at the baptism. So the whole of Mark's gospel is set up to intrigue you and tease you with the question, who is Jesus? And so the one thing you must not do, I go, is go through, okay, this verse supports my belief, I'll take this one, but by the way, please don't look at uh, the other texts in there. I would say read the whole of Mark's gospel, uh, I challenge you to do that, Shabir, and folks here, because increasingly the work that's been done on early high Christology in the, gospel, in the New Testament, so that actually Mark has got one of the highest Christologies of all. We've long sort of, you know, people have thought it's John, it's actually not, it's Mark, when you read Mark through Jewish eyes. Okay. Actually, my next question will pick up on something you just Wonderful. said. Wonderful. Uh, and so the, the Roman centurion looked at Jesus and said, truly this man was the son of God in Mark's gospel. So uh, when he said God, was he referring to Jesus or somebody else of whom Jesus is the son? Well, the simple answer is you're doing exactly the same thing. You're, you're, what you're doing is you're going, okay, let's take all of those later Christological debates from the 2nd and 3rd century, read them back into the Gospels, go, oh, son, God, which was it? And I think, um, I think it was Richard Borkham who said one of the mistakes that people have historically made in reading the Gospels is we take those ontic, ontology categories from the later d debates, read them back into the Gospels, rather than what the Gospel is trying to do, what the New Testament is doing, is raising the question, who is Jesus? And then later Christology comes along and tries to answer the question, how is he possible? Interesting, there's a, there's a parallel there to Islam, of course, because as you all well know, the Quran makes a whole variety of theological claims and ideas, including its conception of who God is, Tawheed, through to the idea that the Quran is uncreated, so a whole series of other things. And then it sort of leaves them hanging, and we can raise all kinds of questions, but as you know, that's where Tafsir comes in. We then go into the second, third, fourth century of Islam, and we can see Islamic right theologians and writers going, okay, that's what the Quran says, and as Muslims you believe it, how do we now make sense of it? I mean, we could spend a whole evening talking about the debates around free will and the eternal Quran in early Islam. And so I always say, and I think when it comes to the identity of Jesus, keep it separate. And tonight's discussion was, who is Jesus? I'm perfectly happy if you go, well, Jesus clearly thought he was he was God, but quite frankly, it's bonkers because that can't work philosophically. I'd be very happy if we got you to that point tonight, Shabir. And that's what I'd encourage you this evening. I'd encourage you to look at the gospel and go, who does Jesus think he is? How that's possible and how that works philosophically, it's a whole fun other debate. But tonight's debate is not the Trinity. It's who did Jesus think he was? I think. Could be wrong. 
I know you've got James White there. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually that, that last comment uh, uh, brings me to, to a point which I was uh, going to raise anyhow. Good. Uh, but uh, I, I feel that, that you actually misunderstood the title of our, our debate. It's not who did Jesus think he was, or did early Christians worship Jesus, is uh, was Jesus man, myth, or God? Uh, so on the question of mm -hmm. was he God, it is not sufficient uh, to, uh, it's important to show, but not sufficient uh, to show that uh, some people worship Jesus, because as you know, uh, Justin Martyr re remarked that uh, Christians in his time worshipped angels, and uh, Christians to our day may, may worship, for example, Mary, uh, some Christians, uh, but, but not regarding her as God. Mm -hmm. So your proof, whether from Pliny or from yep. even the New Testament, that some Christians included Jesus in their worship, uh, does, do you think that that proves uh, sufficiently that Jesus is God? Brilliant question. Now, you obviously waved our, our, our mutual friend, actually, James White around. I knew James when he had more hair, and now he's gone bald. But uh, yeah, James is a, is a great Christian scholar. Um, one of the scholars I relied on um, for this evening, and again, encourage folks in the audience um, who really want to sort of pursue this to look into. There are two really helpful books. And actually, if you pull down my PowerPoint slides, I, I, on my website, I have a link to them on Amazon. Larry Hurtado's book, Lord Jesus Christ, is the go-to study now on worship, uh, the, uh, the worship practice of Christianity, of Christians in the first 300 years. What's interesting is he points out every Christian group we know about, even the weird orthodox, uh, non-orthodox ones, even the Gnostics for goodness sake, worshipped Jesus. And then what he does, is what I've tried to do this evening, is do a historical, a historical inquiry. We start from there and we work our way backwards. That's why I very deliberately started with Revelation, Hebrews, the later Old Testament, and then we went to John, then we went down. And you can go down, 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 and once you've concluded, A, all the Christian groups that we know about worshipped Jesus, and I don't really think that's taken, that's, that's, that's up for grabs now, really. I think that's, that work's been done. Then we have to ask the question, where did those lines of inquiry go? That was Borkham's point that I gave almost towards the end, that that Christology predates the Gospels, predates all of our New Testament documents because it's very early. Philippians, which you know you briefly talked about, what's exciting there is some folks think that is that Christian hymn there dates within two or three years of the resurrection. So James Dunn of, uh, well, now emeritus um, at, at uh, Durham University, um, talks about if you actually do the work and, and work out where that's come from, we're probably talking the mid-30s of the Jerusalem church. So that raises the question, does this go into Jesus? And that's why I then took the step in the second half of my discussion and going, okay, now let's, now let's look at Jesus. And I gave you, as I say, seven lines of evidence. If we had time, I could give you 50. It's a fascinating topic when you start looking at it, particularly through a Jewish lens, uh, not reading those later, new te those later doctrinal categories in. Doctrine is important, but put it in the right historical context. Oh. I have time for two, two more minutes. I can ask two more, one minutes, more question. Saying. You realize that's a using his Winston Churchill impression there for a moment. I think. <laughs> Okay. Now, um, you, you brought up the, the subject uh, of myth, and of course, you, I did. you, you, you do not accept the chronic uh, depiction of, of Jesus. I, um, I do not. And yes. I quoted your, your uh, good words yourself, uh, sure. by the way. Uh, but, but, but I want to know uh, whether uh, you, you, you feel that there are certain aspects of Christian theology uh, about Jesus which is also mythical. Like, for example, the idea that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Because Paul says he's our Passover Lamb, but mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we know that the Passover Lamb was not killed for sins. And, uh, and, and John's gospel um, reworks the narrative so that Jesus dies uh, along with the Passover lamb. So he changed the date of the crucifixion for that purpose. Um, is this not all hmm. mythical? Good question. I think, I think the first thing I want to say, I mean, I'm very glad that you raised the question of, of early on in your, in your presentation of what myth is. And I think, of course, myth is, a, myth is a particular category, right? I think myth is, myth is misused. God, I'm developing a, a lisp here. Myth, myth, is, myth is misused. Technically, myth describes kind of stories and legends that happen in a kind of timeless space unconnected from history. And of course, one of the responses to, uh, you know, sort of 19th century critics who thought the Gospels were myth was, one of the problems is they have a specific date and time on them. As Monty Python's Life of Brian says, you know, Judea 33 AD about tea time. And so yeah, that's an actual real date and time on, on there. So when you have that, it's not a myth. With the Quran, of course, we have all the stories in the Quran are disconnected from, from time and, and geography, as you'll be aware. Um, you know, I often point out to students that if you just had the Quran and didn't have the Gospels, you wouldn't know where Jesus lived, when Jesus lived. All of those things have been stripped away. And a lot of the stories have that kind of mythic timeless kind of quality to them and as you in that video interview said yeah 
lots of these are fables retold for edification. Now, when it comes to things like the Lamb of God and those kind of things, two things are going on, right? Firstly, of course, that imagery goes back to Jesus. So in, in, in the Last Supper, in that meal that he had with his followers, he was the one who takes that, that great sort of Passover celebration from the Old Testament, takes those words that every Jew would be familiar with. Every Jew knew what you should say when the bread and the cup go by. And then it's Jesus who reinterprets that around what he's going to do. And again, most scholars are comfortable with those words go to the historical Jesus. They're very, very early. Now, does that mean that later Christians reflect on that? I have no problem with people unpacking the reality of what something means. We see the same, we see the same in Islam um, going on. I don't think that's the problem. The problem is, is what it's based on actually got a space and time and historical address on it? And I think in the case of that imagery about Jesus, it has. And talking about time, <laughs> our friend here is, is, is waving that at us. Please switch your roles. Sure. Switch my ro <laughs> Right, okay, that sounds like my old amateur of <laughs> dramatics days. Switch my roles. Okay, right. Okay, so um, I guess the, the first um, question I wanted to ask about Shibi was I said I was going to pick up on this. I just love your, your reflection and opportunity to flesh this out a bit. I want to talk about methodology for a few moments. I, sure. I landed with that quote from Tom Wright about, mm -hmm. you know, people have the, their view of God, they try and jam Jesus into it. If he doesn't fit, they either break bits off Jesus or they break bits off God. And I tried to demonstrate in my talk, it was quite a careful methodology, historical, diving down, 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 all quite structured. Um, it did look a little bit to me, and maybe I'm being unfair here, that you sort of came along, Islamic view of Jesus, let's pick the verses from the Bible that support that, let's not talk about the ones that don't. What was the, what's the actual methodology by which you had handle the Gospels, you handle the Christian literature. Because occasionally I get a sense that you do this sometimes with Christian writings, like, you know, Raymond Brown gets trotted out with a couple of favourite quotations, but you don't sort of engage with the whole of his work. So what's your methodology that you use when you engage the Gospels or when you engage Christian theology mm -hmm. as an academic? I've actually ex explained much of this in my presentation itself. What I've said is that uh, there is an obvious development uh, of the idea about Jesus among the Gospels and, and in the New Testament writings, you can see that Jesus is being made from a man into a God. Um, so so that, that's one level of looking at the Gospels. But then, I've also uh, said that even if you take the documents as they are, the entire New Testament as it is, it, it doesn't actually teach the Trinity doctrine, and it doesn't actually teach that Jesus is the Almighty God. It, it, there are passages which teach that Jesus is somewhere between man and God, an intermediary through whom God created the, the universe. I know Muslims will not accept that. I do not not accept that. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, our Christian friends are not living with that either. They have even taken it further and regarded Jesus as the Almighty God and that leads to the difficulties with the Trinity. That's where the Trinity comes in. Because you need something like the Trinity to explain that despite taking Jesus as the Almighty God uh, and knowing that he worshipped God, you still only have one God. Uh, so so that, that's my methodology as I've um, already explained in my lecture. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, second uh, thing I'd like to talk about for uh, for a few moments. Obviously, I'm in an I. I, you know, I, I baited you slightly, but then you baited <laughs> me, so this is fun. On the, on the, on the correct. This is no, this is great because I, Shabir, I, I just want to say, I, well, I love dialoguing with you because you're gracious. We can go to and fro, but afterwards, uh, we're still friends. I think. Um, <laughs> one question in between. Yeah. One question I want to talk about for a few moments, um, Shabir, is um, in fact, let me read you a quotation. I'd love to get your reflection on this. Obviously, there's a whole issue of what the Quran thinks about Jesus, because I'm intrigued, as you actually admitted, that the Jesus you've almost constructed doesn't really fit the Quran or, or fit the Bible. Let me just read you. Very famous, um, Chris, a very famous uh, scholar of Islam who you've quoted yourself, Sidney Griffith, says this. He says, he would seem that much Christian lore in Syriac lies behind the Quran's evocation of the Christian scriptures, the beliefs and practices of the churches, and their homiletic traditions. They must have circulated among the many Arabic-speaking Christians in the Quran's original audience in the time of Muhammad. So, Sydney there painting this picture of all these stories floating around Arabia. Um, two questions out of that. One, what do you think it was about the, that kind of oral milieu, and you alluded to it in that quote from the video, that fascinated Muhammad? And has fascinated people since, actually. I've got the Muslim Jesus here by Khalidi, who collates you know, hundreds of traditions from Islam. What was it about Jesus that so intrigued Muslims? And what do we do with the fact that the Quran does seem to be dependent on this earlier sort of oral mass of traditions? And we, we understand that a lot more now than we did 20 years ago. So I'd just love to get your perspective as a, as a Muslim on, on that, and as someone yeah. who I know has read Sydney. Hmm. So from a Muslim perspective, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, was not acting alone. He was 
being guided by God. The Quran was being revealed to him from the Almighty God. And God is uh, presenting in the Quran uh, lessons and moral, uh, um, um, the morals of various stories that people are already familiar with. So the Quran basically reminds people by saying is, when such and such a thing happened, that's in the Arabic is, that introduces a story. So it calls people to recall the, st the story, and then uh, it tells them, okay, well, this is what the story teaches. What is important in the Quran is what the story uh, teaches. It's the Quran's own theology and moral lessons which are driven, ho driven home uh, with the use of these uh, stories. Obviously, the Quran had uh, to speak to the people according to their level of understanding and uh, um, appeal to them based on uh, what they already knew to be, uh, uh, that they can, what, what they knew to be the stories that they can take as the premises and say, okay, if that's the premise, then this is the conclusion. Mm. Uh, what is important there is the conclusion, not so much the premise. Okay. It's interesting, five minutes. So I actually just got one last question, actually. So um, I, it's interesting you, you, you talk about that because I think I mentioned, um, as we were chatting beforehand, the last two years, some colleagues and I have been working on the first digital critical edition of the Quran. I've actually got it on my laptop. So it's quite fun. A couple of clicks of the mouse and you can find all kinds of linguistic patterns and so forth. And that, that id pattern that you, you describe is there. The Quran uses that little Arabic introduction, uh, that little Arabic word that's introduced a lot of stories. One of the problems, of course, is it uses them to introduce things that we know are historical and things that are fables. So the, the audience have no way of knowing the two. But here's the last question I had for you. You said in your presentation, you described Jesus as great and you described him as successful. There were various other words. You were going at high speed like I do, so mm -hmm. I tried to keep up with you, but I'm not sure which one of us talks the fastest. But here's my question. On an Islamic understanding, help me understand how Jesus was great or successful. I used that, uh, I used that quote from Larry Hurtado to go, if he didn't want people to worship him, he was singularly uh, uh, a disaster in communicating that. Um, if, and I know you, you hold a slightly odd view about the, about the crucifixion uh, in, in the Muslim community, but you know, many Muslims believe that Jesus wasn't crucified. Allah kind of sort of, you know, sort of teleported him up to heaven and rescued him. And of course, therefore, the reason that two billion Christians today think he rose from the dead and worship him is because Allah did a conjuring trick and Jesus didn't tell them. To what extent on Islam was Jesus great or successful? Because he seems to be in a spectacular failure in communicating his intentions, if your understanding is correct. But I'd love to hear you reflect on that. Yeah. So um, I don't think I used the term successful when, okay. I, when I spoke, but I did speak of Jesus being a mighty messenger of God. Right. Um, even that I might not have actually said now, but uh, I, I've said this from time to time. Jesus is a great messenger of God, Muslim understanding. He was the Messiah, uh, born of um, a virgin according to um, a Muslim interpretation of the Quran, um, though this is not asserted in the Quranic uh, language itself. Um, the, uh, Jesus raised the dead, cured the blind, healed the leper. I, I said all of these things tonight. Um, I didn't say successful, but I don't, I want, I don't want to deny him the, the term, but it's not a term that I used here, here tonight, uh, just to be clear. Uh, but in what sense would Jesus have been successful? He would have successfully uh, carried out his mission, which was to preach the message. The Quran says again and again, وَمَا عَلَى الرَّسُولِ إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ The messenger's uh, task is only uh, to plainly convey the message. Now, what was done with the message after him, this is uh, not the messenger's responsibility. Uh, this could be the work, uh, if, no, if, his message, if his message is distorted, uh, then this could be the work of Satan. It could be the, the work of his followers following their own desires. It could be that they are copying um, the Greeks and Romans who took gods and godlings and goddesses and, and worshipped sons of God along with God and divine men uh, and, and so on. Uh, so that wouldn't be the fault of the messenger himself. As for the crucifixion that you asked about, my particular view is that when the Quran says ma qataluhu wa ma walakin halahum, they killed him not nor crucified him but it was so made to appear to them uh, it is, uh, the, the, the most likely meaning of this is that while the Jews thought that they were killing Jesus, in fact they did not actually succeed in killing him but God raised him to himself uh, in a way that is mysterious. Uh, and, uh, and I see um, a support for this in the Gospels themselves, because in the Gospels, we see that there is an attempt, especially in the later Gospels, to prove that Jesus actually died on the cross, like in John's Gospel with the spear thrust. Um, uh, but in the earliest uh, recollections, for example, in Mark's Gospel, we find that Pilate was amazed that Jesus could have died so soon, because
because obviously crucifixion does not pierce any vital organ and uh, a, a person is left to linger on the cross uh, sometimes for a couple of days until he expires uh, from vol volemic shock. Uh, so Pilate was amazed that Jesus could have died so soon but as Raymond Brown pointed out uh, the later gospels of Matthew and Luke omitted mention of Pilate's amazement because they didn't want their own readers uh, to start wondering how did Jesus die so soon. Okay, that was the one minute sign, but let's, uh, let's uh, draw a line there. Thank you. Thank you, Shabir. Who's your question directed towards? Your, who's your question directed towards? Okay, and can you say your name as well, please? My name's Luca, Doctor, thank you for coming. I just have a question. Um, Dr. Bannister brought up in Mark 14 how the Jews recognized that Jesus was calling himself God. And that's why they killed him, because he was being blasphemous. So do you think the Jews misunderstood what Jesus was saying? Like, what's your, do you have any comments on what he was saying there? What he claimed, what he claimed to be the son of man? Um, I don't think he was call, claiming to be God in that passage, and um, we cannot say that the Jews necessarily understood him. In fact, the Gospels show throughout that the Jews kept misunderstanding him. In John's Gospel in particular, Jesus would say he is the Son of God, and they thought that he was claiming to be God, and Jesus said, no, I only claim to be the Son of God. Uh, John chapter 10, for, uh, for example. Um, they pick up stones to stone him, saying that he, he was a man claiming to be God, but he kept uh, explaining that he was only claiming to be the Messiah. He said, I told you who I was uh, in, in John chapter 8. And in, in verse number 40, he says, a man who told you the truth that I heard from God. So he kept clarifying, but they kept misunderstanding. In Mark chapter 2, you don't have to wait for chapter 14 to give the Jews a reason to kill him. In Mark chapter 2, uh, they, they were already started to conspire to kill him because he healed a man on the Sabbath. He didn't claim to be God. He only claimed that it's a, it's a good thing to do good works on the day of the Sabbath. And they were already conspiring to kill him. So they didn't need a, a genuine reason. They were trying to kill him by hook or crook. You cannot claim that they then understood Jesus. It seems that they were deliberately misunderstanding him. Can I just add something there very, very quickly? I think, I think the interesting thing, and this ties into one of the last things that you said when I asked you a question, Shabir. I think that's a wonderful question that you ask. Because when you read Mark 14, to go, if Jesus was misunderstood, the only person he's got, we've got to thank for that is Jesus himself. Because if you read the passage in Mark 14, the high priest says, are you the Christ, the, the son of the blessed one? Jesus says, I am. Uh, echoing the divine name Yahweh and then quotes Daniel 7 you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one to go my word you think you were misunderstood I mean of all the possible answers to give when you've been asked that question in that setting um, it really does raise the question of if Jesus didn't intend to be uh, taken that way the guy quite frankly was incompetent um, because it's a lunatic answer if you don't want to be taken the way that, that he was he was taken Thank you for that question. A question for Dr. Bannister, please. Can I see a hand somewhere? <laughs> okay, a text, please. Oh, that was a hand. Okay. Uh, uh, can you stand up and say your name and speak loud and clear, please? Uh, my name is Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is, uh, when Jesus said that uh, he does not know the when the mm. hour uh, will come. Yes. The Son of Man will come back. Um, how do you explain that if he does not know the fullness of God? Yeah. That's a great question. I'd say a couple of things, Kevin. Here's the first thing I'd say. What's interesting is, again, always read the passage. Because what's interesting, when you, when you look at what Jesus is saying, the first thing is look at what he, what he is. He's separating himself from humanity. He's separating himself from the angels. Um, so, you know, a good example in a Muslim context, if Shabir was to go to a Muslim country and say, you know, well, in terms of the last day, um, you know, uh, human beings don't know, and angels don't know, and all the prophets don't know, not even I know, I suspect people go, who do you think you are? Right there, you've differentiated. So Jesus puts himself on the side of, of God at that point. Now, is there, is there, are there some roles with it between the Father and the Son and the Godhead? I think you, that's unavoidable to, to draw that conclusion. Absolutely. But in terms of Jesus putting, putting himself on the side of God rather than non-God, the very way he frames the answer does that. If, again, if Jesus had not wanted to be misunderstood, he could have gone, well, I'm just a man, how would I know? But to say, you know, not even the angels uh, know that, and certainly not, not even I know that. There's almost this ascending order of, of reality. 
and again what I keep coming back to is I think all the work that's been done on early high Christology and I encourage you to google that term actually that's the, the term for this new movement in understanding the Gospels has been that the, the Jewish mindset really is all in the first century was all about how do you determine God from non-God you've got two categories you've got over here is everything else and over here is God and the question is which, which box does Jesus belong in and by the way that he talks the titles he uses time and time and time again he's clearly identifying himself in this box and then as I say third fourth century uh, doctrinal development was how do we figure out how that box works um, but what's interesting is the debate was never is Jesus in that box the debate was always how does that box fit together which is interesting I'll talk more about that in my summing up did you want to add anything to that Dr. Ali um, well, yes, um, I, I, I don't think that Andy is facing the question. Saying that Jesus uh, is in the same box with God uh, it, it, it just means that he's on the same team. It doesn't mean that he is God. And, and the, his very admission that he does not know the, when the hour will occur actually places him with the angels because the angels do not know. Only the Father knows, so everyone else do not know. Neither the Son nor the angels. Uh, now, Muslims, of course, do not accept the title literally Son of God. God, uh, for Jesus, but it looks like uh, Christians are not accepting this verse, which shows that Jesus does not know uh, when the hour will occur, because clearly if he doesn't know when the hour will occur, there is one thing he doesn't know, that the Father knows, and therefore he, the Son, is not the omniscient God, only the Father qualifies for that. Okay, we have a question coming in from text for you, Dr. Ali. What evidence or answer can Andy Bannister give you to make you believe that Christianity is the one true religion? We're just going to go over go the big questions here. What would the evidence look like um, if Andy was to present an evidence tonight? What would you be looking for? Well, in, in terms of the more specific questions that we've been dealing with, is Jesus God? Uh, to begin with, if the, if the New Testament does not clearly assert that Jesus is God, then, then we do not have any good reason for thinking that he is God. See, God is not a superman. It's not that we're, we're just inventing what we want God to be like. There is a clear definition put forward by St. Anselm of Canterbury, a Christian scholar, who said that God is that be beyond which nothing greater can be conceived. I, I've mentioned this in many dialogues. I haven't found any Christian or Muslim to disagree with this simple definition of God. So starting with a simple definition like that of God, uh, it proving that Jesus is great, he is greater than Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman all put together, greater than the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen or whatever, or whatever they are called, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, proving that he is so great proving that he is as great as the archangel Gabriel doesn't prove that he is God. So we have to have at least a clear statement from the New Testament. Otherwise saying that Jesus came, he performed these great miracles, therefore he is God. The therefore here doesn't work. The ergo doesn't follow. Uh, it, it only follows that he is great. Whatever he is, he is great. But th it takes another important step to say that he is actually God. And in John chapter 8 verse 54, Jesus speaks to the Jews and he says, My father whom you claim is your God. Notice how different that is from Yahweh speaking in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Yahweh says, I am the Lord your God. Now Jesus in the New Testament says, the one who said, I am the Lord your God, that's the one who I'm calling my Father. So it's not saying, I am the, the Lord your, your God. So where is that statement where Jesus says, I am the, the Lord your God so, in the New Testament? There's nothing like that. That's a great question. Let me, let me chip in because it's fun with the, the dialogue um, going on that. <laughs> How do you follow the League of, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? <laughs> uh, it reminds me, it's funny thing, last time, Shabir, we, we debated, you, um, you, you took five of your points from the Cinderella movie. And I feel a bit cheeky saying this. One of my, one of the, Justin Trotier, the atheist on the panel, leant over and said, we should rename you uh, Cinderella. Um, <laughs> What I would say, the answer to that actually, for the person who, who asked it, is to go again, if you read the New Testament using Jewish Christology, using Jewish categories, the, the, by far the best introduction to this is Richard Borkham's little book, God Crucified. It's phenomenal because it's only 80 pages, and any scholar who can write in 80 pages and you can read it in an evening wins my prize. Unlike Hurtado, you could, you know, could beat a whale to death with that book. Sorry, I'm not suggesting we do, by the way, for the environmentalists in the room, of going that actually it's on page after page page after page after page after page as like Raymond Brown you know one of the greatest New Testament scholars of the last few years it's on every single page and I think what's what's going on and I think where I think the struggle that, that you're having should be here is you're thinking through okay so Jesus has to be equal to the Father in every possible way whereas what the um, 
What uh, Borkham introduces in God Crucified as a helpful term is what's going on in the New Testament is what he calls a Christology of divine identity. And Jesus belongs to the identity of God. That's the phrase that is the most helpful to understand what's going on in the New Testament. Witnessed by the fact, for example, none of the New Testament writers can talk about God without talking about, about Jesus. The two go together. Jesus belongs to God's identity. And comparing them with each other is, just is, is to break the logic of the, of the New Testament. And so if you read the New Testament, I'll Start ask, answer, asking the question, does Jesus belong to the identity of God? What does that look like? Suddenly, huge amounts of it fall into place. Thank you. Another quick question for Andy. There's actually a couple of uh, that have come in in this vein. Uh, how do you define the Trinity in contrast to what Dr. Ali spoke about tonight? Or another question phrased it similarly. How could we speak of the Trinity or how would you speak of the Trinity uh, so as to not be a heretic? Oh, that's a great question. Um, in fact, the, the great book, actually, I'm really glad that, that Shabir mentioned kind of heresy, because I completely agree. It is you know, quite easy to try and describe the Trinity, and you invent three uh, amusing heresies before breakfast. And in fact, if you really want to have some fun with this after the evening, get onto your laptops and Google St. Patrick's Bad Analogies. A um, few of you know that one. To go, It's a really comic look at some of the bad heresies uh, throughout Christian history. And I promise I won't say, come on, Patrick, to uh, Shabir at any point for those of you who already know that uh, video. Um, but the book I really like on this actually is called The Cruelty of Heresy by, I forget the author's name, if you put it into Amazon. And what's interesting, he looks at some of those heresies, but in particular shows why they're important. Um, because if you misunderstand the Trinity, it's not just some vague theological conception you get wrong. Actually, you lose a lot of God in the process. For example, if Jesus does not belong to the identity of God, then actually we can't actually fundamentally know about God. You have a God who is very likely of deism or the god of Gnosticism which has been an influence on the Quran who is distant and remote. Remember in Islam not even Muhammad had God speak to him directly when the Quran was revealed unlike the Old Testament prophets. In the, in, in the Bible you have this god who is earthy and engaged with reality, a god who is imminent as well as a god who is transcendent and that gets lost in many other conceptions of God. So to understand the Trinity I'd recommend to take a look at that book and there's also because I'm a great believer in recommending resources if you really want to think through the Trinity as a Christian a soundbite isn't going to do it. Mike Reeves, uh, uh, Delighting in the Trinity, is a wonderful little book. That I, he's a wonderful church historian. will help you understand the Trinity, think about it, and get it right. It's worth reflecting and doing it properly rather than doing theology by tweet. We'll take two more questions from the floor for each of our panelists. I saw a hand up there last time. Can, do you want to stand, please? Say your name and uh, your question, please. Yeah, so my name is Wesley, and my question's for Shabir. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, Andy's seven points about what uh, Jesus claims about himself in terms of the title of Lord of the Sabbath. And uh, are you aware of the intertestamental literature that declares that the Lord of the Sabbath is a, is a claim that only Yahweh has because it claims to um, spin the cosmic orbs in their order and to raise the sun in the morning? And that's why you mentioned... Mark chapter 2, that's one of the key reasons why the Jews um, seek to kill him. Um, as for these uh, seven points, uh, basically they boil down to saying that Jesus was claiming to be somebody special. And uh, later on Andy said, well that m proves that he is greater than the Old Testament prophets. Uh, but my re simple response to that is proving that he is greater than the Old Testament prophets, even if you prove that he is greater than the Archangel Gabriel, uh, that doesn't prove that he is God. I mean, you're, you're getting there, but, but you're not quite there. Uh, because uh, Jesus uh, you know, can be great and yet not be God. The Archangel Gabriel is great, but he is not God. Michael is great, but not God, and so on. So we, we need some identity statement. Jesus is God, and, and that is the identity statement that is, uh, that is quite lacking, and Andy has been uh, unable to provide through our whole discussion here so far. Uh, and as for some teasing, well, Jesus said he's Lord of the Sabbath, and somebody understood this based on what was uh, being discussed in the intertestamental period, and they took that to mean that he's claiming to be God. Well, that 
that does not really wash because uh, in, in the end, Jesus is claiming, I do not know when the hour will occur. And that is a clear admission that he's not God. Uh, moreover, in, in the same gospel according to Mark, uh, in chapter 10, verse number 17, a man called him good, a good teacher, and he said, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Uh, th this is a clear admission that Jesus himself is not God. Uh, the, the one that he was praying to is the Almighty God. Now Jesus goes down on his knees and prays, according to Luke's gospel. In Matthew's gospel, he falls on his face and prayed, uh, in, in, uh, just as Muslims do to this day. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. In, in John's gospel, Jesus looks up to heaven and prays and declares the one he's praying to as the only true God and himself as the Messiah, uh, which means just simply uh, one who is set aside for uh, the service of God, uh, but, but obviously not God himself. So it's very clear that uh, Jesus is not declaring himself to be God, but quite the contrary. Can I say something very quickly, my response? Um, I find first a couple of things I find interesting. One is that, you know, the, the sort of pressure is on me. Show where Jesus said, I am God. But uh, of course, I could turn to you and say, show me where Jesus says, I am not God in that exact phrase. And the answer is he, he doesn't. We have to look at what he does say. I do find it interesting that you seem to have no problem with Jesus going around going, my words are greater than Torah. I am equivalent to divine wisdom. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. You don't need the temple. I am the replacement for the temple. Uh, we could look in Luke, uh, where, and we'll talk about this in my closing statement, where Jesus claims to be embodying the return of Yahweh. And uh, your view, Shabir, is to go, oh, he was just maybe thinking he was greater than an angel. And then goodness knows why all those first century Jews either got irritated with him or worship him. I can't imagine why to go, I have to say, Jesus could have done with a better PR advisor or a better theological advisor in terms of the claims, because in terms of the Jewish context and scholarship means looking at what Jesus said in his context, that, thank you Wes, that's good scholarship, that's how we understand who Jesus is, not quote mining and not cherry picking. Another question for Dr. Bannister, please. There. Oh, right at the back. I, with the white oh, sorry, hat, yeah. stand up. Yeah, we can go do ahead. it. Go ahead. Yeah. Go, for, go for it. Yeah. Can you stand up and yeah. say it nice and loud, okay. please? Um, just kind of came to mind. I'm wondering if Jesus really wasn't God in the flesh, and he really is who you said he was, a great prophet, and he recognizes his place being below God. Why did he never once even so much as hint or mention the name Allah in all in all the Okay, so uh, the name Allah obviously is an Arabic word, and um, it, it refers to um, the, the one true God, the God of Abraham. And today, um, Arabic-speaking Muslims and Christians and Jews uh, use this term Allah uh, for for God. The corresponding term in in Syriac in which Jesus spoke uh, would have been Elo, and uh, or. Um, something of this nature. I, I'm a little bit vague now, but uh, we know that from the cross, uh, Jesus is reported to have said, Eli, Eli, uh, lema sabachthani, uh, my, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is another uh, clear uh, indication that Jesus regarded someone else as his God. And, and the term Eli, actually, uh, Elo in the Hebrew, is a close uh, equivalent to uh, the Arabic Allah, which is uh, basically El with the def definition article al el al allah uh, basically uh, ilah is the corresponding arabic for el and al ilah is the is the combination the definite article plus al ilah which means the god so basically jesus on the cross was calling out to allah and uh, that that shows that he has a god and he was calling out to that god in his moment uh, of uh, distress and that proves that he himself was not god regardless of whatever else you might say about him. Can I? Because yeah, you tried to direct it partly to, to me as well. Let me say a couple of things. Obviously, in terms of what Jesus was crying out of the cross, he was quoting from the Psalms, from Psalm 22, and also Psalm 110 gets picked up in other places as well. Worth looking at those. One thing I'd say very quickly. That was a good, great. Thank you for the, the linguistic summary there. I was thinking, glad I don't have to answer that one because my, my 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 Arabic uh, etymology briefly uh, eluded me. But one thing is interesting, just on what you say. One thing that's often missed, of course, is in the Old Testament and the New Testament throughout the Bible, we don't just have uh, God's title. You know, uh, you know uh, the, the, the Ilar or Elohim or so on and so forth. We also have God's name. 
And so in Exodus chapter 3, of course, you know, is the famous story of the burning bush where, where God reveals his own personal name, Yahweh, to Moses. And that name turns up, I think, from memory. Is it 4,328 times in the Old Testament? I used to actually know the figure. That's demonstrably wrong, but at least sounds impressive. Unless you're sitting next to someone with a BSc in maths and a calculator. Interesting thing, though. Interesting thing. It doesn't turn up in the Quran. And I've always found that fascinating, and I think one reason being, of course, is Muhammad interacted with the Jewish communities there in Arabia. The Jews became very protective about the divine name Yahweh. They wouldn't pronounce it. In fact, Jews, faithful Jews today just call it the name. They won't, they won't say it. And so there was no surprise in one sense that when the Jewish community encountered Muhammad, who claims to be a prophet like the Old Testament prophets, which they, they don't believe that, and they reject him, and of course that sets up all the tension between Islam and Judaism, um, to go, of course, the last thing the Jews are going to do is tell Muhammad the name of God. And that's actually the fact that the name Yahweh doesn't occur in the Arabic text of the Quran, even though Arabic and Hebrew are sister languages, is I think a very big clue um, that actually we're not dealing with revelation, we're dealing with things we can explain through oral tradition and other mechanisms. Are we out of time? Oh, okay. We have another question from, uh, from text here for Dr. Bannister. Yeah. Uh, there's a point when Jesus is being crucified and it says that God looks away from him because of all the sin that he bears. How is this possible if Jesus is God? Yeah, oh, what a wonderful question. Because, of course, that gets right to the whole question of why it is that Jesus came. And as well as the you know, various kind of lofty titles and things that would be, frankly, outrageous uh, in the case of Jesus, uh, were they not true? The other thing that Jesus consistently claimed to be doing was coming to do something about the problem of sin. And the interesting thing, and again, I'm, I'm going to talk about this at the end, the interesting thing about sin, of course, is it's um, a universal human problem. And as somebody once said, of course, sin is the one empirically verifiable Christian and, I suppose you would say, Muslim doctrine. Just look around us. Um, if it's not Donald Trump, it's Donald Trump. And, um, you know, look at the world that we're in. And so now the question becomes, what is God going to do about that? And, of course, one of the issues is that uh, the Bible teaches that we have a God who is a God who is holy and righteous. We also have a God who is forgiving and, and merciful. And the problem is, of course, is that forgiving and forgiveness and mercy and justice are actually contradictory to one another. If God is going to be a God who is holy and righteous, he can't simply overlook sin. And in a nutshell, the incredible news about what Jesus did, and Jesus talks about this in places like Mark 10, 45, he talks about it in the Last Supper tradition and elsewhere, that Jesus saw his role as being the one who would come, step into our place, offer to bear our sin, so that God could cast judgment on it, deal with it, and God could forgive us, while also being a God who is just. And actually, interestingly, the Quran has an echo of that in Surah 17, 15, where it says this enigmatic little phrase that no bearer of sin uh, can bear the sin of another. And it's fascinating that in both the Muslim tradition and the Christian tradition, Jesus is the only sinless one. I remember early on in my Islamic studies being fascinated uh, by that. If you look at the earliest tafsir, earliest commentary on the Quran, um, this idea that the other prophets were sinless comes much later in Islam. It's the idea that Jesus is a sinless one uh, is there in the, uh, in the traditions. So that's why um, that, that, uh, that, that's there. The Cross of Christ by John Stott is the book to read if you really want to dig into that. Oh, he's looming. St. Michael. <laughs> Did you want to respond to that? Um, well, just yeah. we can take we can take one. Sure. Uh, and, and, and of course, the Quran in, in Surah 17, verse number 15, "La taziru wa ziratun wizra ukhra," and no bearer of uh, of burdens will bear another's uh, burden. Uh, that that is very different from the Christian understanding. The Muslim understanding is that no one dies for anyone else's sins. God forgives sins, and if we get forgiveness by seeing, being sincere in our repentance, by repairing the harm we've done to other people, asking God for His forgiveness, and uh, following up with uh, with good deeds. Now, I believe that our Christian friends have to do the same things, even though they believe that Jesus died for their sins. You still have to do good deeds, you still have to repent, you still have to ask God to forgive you, you still have to repair the harm you do to other people. So what difference did the sacrifice of Jesus make? Now, I want to go back to Andy's point about mythology. Um, and, and this is a myth that was introduced by St. Paul in his writings, and they are found in the Gospels. The Gospels have become uh, passion narratives with long introductions. They want to prove that Jesus died for the sins of the world. 
Uh, but uh, think about it. it. It doesn't make any difference that Jesus died for the sins of the world. If Adam sinned and that got us driven out of paradise, then Jesus' sacrifice should have righted that, that wrong, and we should have been back in paradise. Uh, and of course, uh, the Garden of Eden is somewhere in Mesopotamia, somewhere in Iraq, uh, and uh, our first parents were naked. So if we go back to that original state, we will all be, uh, you know, in, in Iraq right now. But of, cor of course, it didn't happen. Uh, the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus did not re uh, re restore anything. And, and we still have to do the same things that we did before. Uh, Christians might say, well, the one sacrifice canceled all of the temple sacrifices. But did you realize that uh, up to the year 70, while the temple was still standing, Christians continued to offer sacrifices in the temple. Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament is evidence for that, up to chapter 21, showing that even Paul, when he came to Jerusalem, joined in the temple sacrifices. So the sacrifice of Jesus didn't change anything. This is a, a theology introduced by St. Paul, and, and I would classify this under the mythologies uh, that we talked about. Excellent questions, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll take two more from the floor. Uh, one up there in the corner. Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure if the question's asked consistently, but in John 5.30, Jesus says, By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. My judgment is just, for I seek not to do myself, but him who sent me. And Paul, uh, it is, I think, I believe in the Acts of the Apostles, they also say that Jesus is a man sent by God. So, in that case, if Jesus is differentiating himself from God right now, and he says he can himself do nothing, then are you to say that God is weak because you equate God to Jesus? Yeah. Good question. I, quite simply, I would say, what was your name, by the way? Roshan. Okay. I would say, quite simply, it's answered by, I don't know if you, you said you came in late? Yeah. Okay, so I actually answered it a few moments ago when I talked about the the model that we see throughout all of the got throughout the Gospels um, and throughout the later New Testament is what uh, is increasingly being called um, a Christology of divine identity. And in fact, I, I waved around. You, you may have missed it. The, the the standard book on you know Christian worship of Jesus, Larry Hurtado's book, is quite fun. It's a little sort of clue in the front. He dedicates it to the EHCC. And I always wondered what that was. And then one of my professors when I was studying theology had a mug on his desk with EHCC on it. I was like, what is EHCC? He grinned, he went, oh, Early High Christology Club. It's this whole movement in New Testament scholarship that's happened in the last, probably the last 20 years or so, that has begun realizing, it's pretty obvious really, that we should be reading the New Testament in Jewish categories. And there, what the New Testament is doing is including Jesus within the identity of God. It's not playing Jesus off against God. It's not using later language like Jesus is God. The whole question the Bible sets out to answer is, who is God? That's actually the question the Old Testament sets out to answer. Who is God? He's not some abstract concept as, a, as an Islam who sits up there in heaven and not doesn't even come and interact with anybody. He's a God who's earthy and real. He's a God who walks and talks with Adam and Eve, a God who walks and talks with Abraham, a God who's there at the burning bush with Moses, uh, a God who grieves and gets in, involved with his people. Who is this God like? And the New Testament picks that, that up and carries on and, in, and says that Jesus belongs within that identity. Jesus belongs to the identity of God. Now within that, yes, Jesus saw his role as the son uh, sent by his father and anybody reading that through Middle Eastern Jewish eyes would have no problem uh, with the idea that there's a sort of hierarchy uh, of roles going on there. We see the same in Philippians 2. But the question is, is that New Testament picture accurate? And we see it, as I say, on page after page. After. That's the striking thing. It's there in Mark, it's there in Matthew, it's there in Luke, it's there in John, it's there in Acts. You quote Acts at me, you know, Acts, we have Peter describe Jesus as the author of life. I mean, my word, talk about putting somebody in the, within the divine identity. And it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. Does that mean there are texts we have to wrestle with? Yeah, there are, in the same way that we have to think hard about Tawheed uh, in Islam and how that fits with an uncreated Quran and so forth. But where did Jesus consider he fitted? Did he, did he consider himself in that special relationship to God? Yes, I think so. One last very quick example, and then I hand back to Michael. Think of the twelve. When Jesus picks the twelve disciples and reconstitutes Israel, which is what every New Testament scholar I've read thinks he's, thinks he's doing, who is it who constitutes Israel in the Old Testament? It's Yahweh who brings Israel together, and here we see the twelve there in the New Testament, Jesus writes at the middle of it. Not one of them, not first among equals, not Wonder Woman, certainly, and, um, but, uh, but it's the one who draws it all together. And the more you see this pattern, you see it everywhere. It's, uh, it's incredible. I literally am far more confident about the divinity of Jesus uh, now than I was 10 years ago because I've spent so much time now immersed in this uh, new wave of literature. It's exciting stuff. Go read Borkham, go read Hurtado.
You're welcome. Thank you for that question. Do we have a question for Dr. Ali? <laughs> I think we have one in the front here. Did you have a question? <laughs> she might have a question. Can you say your name and stand up, please, nice and loud, so everybody can hear? Sure. Um, my, my name is Dylan Simon. I have a question for the both of you, actually. Um, it's about, um, what do you, the both of you think about the theories about King um, Zedekiah um, and his encounters with um, Abraham and how that could relate to um, the possibility of, um, of him being a different form of God, not Abraham, but King Zedekiah? And this will be the last question. Yeah. Are you referring to the story in Genesis 18 where Abraham is visited by these three persons? And is that the story? Because I somehow I can't tie King Zedekiah. I can't either, actually. Melchizedek. Yeah. Melchizedek? Melchizedek. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Malik Sadiq. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Well done, that man. This is a bit of a last minute question. I was trying to think, is it Melchizedek? Okay. Is it Zedekiah? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, you can't. Okay. Yeah, do you want to go first on that? No, no, I'll let you, by all means. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Together we got there. Sure. Yeah. Um, actually, your, your question illustrates uh, a, a, a point that um, sometimes uh, Christians are looking back in the Old Testament for some sort of proof or evidence that God came down on the earth, walked among human beings he, um, as a human being himself. But the description in, in the book of Genesis is simply that there was this um, Malik Sadiq, uh, Melchizedek, we, we Anglo size his name to be. Um, he was king of Salem. Um, Abraham uh, paid tribute to him, but uh, that's about it. He's an ordinary human being, a king, but, but nothing to say that this was God here on earth. Yeah, I actually agree with where Shabir ended. I don't, I don't think there's any sense there. I don't think any sense in the text, actually. I think where the imagery that you're probably picking up is from the book of Hebrews. And most uh, commentators on the book of Hebrews think that, that obviously what's going on, in fact, it's, 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 it's pretty obvious when you read it that what's going on is uh, the writer of Hebrews is interacting with an audience who are perhaps tempted to go back to Judaism. And a lot of commentators think probably what's this is written um, during one of the, the early waves of Roman, Roman persecution that had begun. I alluded to this actually with, um, with Pliny the, young, the Younger. And uh, the Romans took grave uh, exception to Christians, largely because they refused to worship Caesar. And the test was very simply, okay, worship Caesar and curse Christ. If you don't, then it's uh, you know, off to the lines with you. And, the, the, uh, and there are lots of clues within the text that uh, I think it's got, you know, things have got so heated that a lot of people are thinking, okay, maybe we should get back to Judaism. It was easier there. And so the writers of the Hebrews is really showing how everything in the Old Testament is actually foreshadowing and pointing uh, forward to, to Jesus. And, uh, and, and basically then he picks up this story of Melchizedek deck and really just uses it to sort of riff off into this idea of Jesus as the heavenly high priest standing there uh, at the right hand of God there in the, on, the, on the throne, you know, in Daniel chapter 7, the imagery that Jesus set up. And of course that's a huge encouragement to those of us who are Christians, because this idea that we have, uh, you know, Jesus has still got that human form. We have a great high priest who has been tempted in every way. And so Jesus looks at you, looks at me, and can understand what it means to wrestle with sin, because he wrestled with sin, was tempted in every way way and didn't fall. Um, we're the only ones who, to have done that. And thus he is not carrying his own burden and can carry our burdens. But nowhere does the text sort of say, and therefore, you know, Melchizedek was God in any sense. It's just playing with this idea that here's this mysterious figure in the Old Testament and then sort of connecting it, like a sermon il il illustration. And I think if you, just re if you read uh, Hebrews chapter 7, that's, um, that's pretty clear. Michael, if you, if you allow me, just short follow-up of that. Uh, perhaps you were intrigued by the mention that he was be be thought beginning of days or end of life, uh, no genealogy and mm. so on, but uh, I wouldn't build mm. too much on yeah. that. Okay. Where we have begun, I want to emphasize again that uh, Muslims and Christians can work together to make our world a better place. Of course, differences in theology uh, should not prevent us from working together. Uh, but I've contended tonight that uh, if, if Christians uh, can um, come to uh, what the Bible actually says about Jesus, then that will bring Christians closer to Muslims, in that Christians would then affirm that despite whatever else you can say about Jesus, Jesus is actually not God. You might say that he's very great, you might say he's the son of God. God. Not that Muslims will accept any of this, but to Muslims it will make a great deal of difference that you are still affirming that there is only one God and there will be here no confusion when you say that. Because if you say that Jesus is God, now we're hearing two. And if you try to explain it to us, it seems that the explanations are recondite. Uh, 
And I noticed that Andy, when he had the chance to explain the Trinity, he, he just pointed to books that explain the Trinity. Uh, it, perhaps he was afraid that if he explained the Trinity, he might fall into one of the heresies that he <laughs> talked about. And so, so this is a difficulty. Now, the difficulty doesn't only come when you try to explain it, but when you come to think about it. Now, of course, we, we cannot think wrong thoughts about God, and we cannot imagine somebody else to be God that is not God. The Old Testament uses the analogy of marriage for our relationship with God, and turning to a false God would be uh, uh, not only idolatrous, but adulterous, according to the Old Testament uh, thinking. So think about your own marriage then. Uh, can you think of some other person as being your spouse, and can you have some confusion as to who actually is your spouse? No. In the mind, it has to be very clear. So when Muslims say that there is only one God, Allah, it is very clear to Muslims whom we're referring to. Uh, but uh, when our Christian friends say that uh, Jesus is God and the Father is God and the Holy Spirit is God, it, there seems to be some lack of clarity. Are these three separate gods? Are there three uh, individuals working together as a team? Is the team stronger than any of the individuals by, by themselves and so on? So uh, thinking about it uh, is like walking on a tightrope. You either fall into one heresy or the other. Either you, you emphasize the distinctiveness in which you seem to have three gods or you minimize the distinctiveness in which you, in which case you fall into Sabellianism or modalism in which you don't anymore have three persons. You have one God, yes, and you have the three modes of existence, but you no longer have the Trinity and you do not have actually three persons. And then you cannot explain why was Jesus on the earth worshiping the Father if they are not actually two. Uh, so there are great difficulties. Now, I want to pick up some of the pieces that uh, were discussed. In the Q&A, somebody asked about Mark 14 again, and this picks up on Andy's point. When Jesus was under trial and he was being asked, are you the Christ, son of the, the blessed? And he says, I am. Well, he's not saying I am God. He's saying I am Christ and son of the blessed. Now, of course, Muslims will not accept that Jesus is literally the son of God. But if Christians accepted that and didn't go the further step and say, well, he's actually God whose son he is, uh, well, well, then uh, Muslims and Christians would actually be closer together because Christians in that case would not be asserting that Jesus is God. They would only be asserting that Jesus is the Son of God. And then Jesus spoke about the Son of Man who will come in the clouds of heaven. Now, as Bruce Chilton has pointed out in Mark's Gospel, when Jesus speaks about the futuristic coming of the Son of Man, he is actually referring to someone else in the third person. He doesn't say, I will come on the clouds of heaven. He's speaking about the the son of man who will come, referring to this in the third person, as someone else as the son of man. Who is this mysterious son of man and when he will come, that's a different question. But in Mark's gospel, as Bruce Chilton ably proves, there, there is no instance where Jesus, in speaking about the futuristic son of man, is actually referring to himself. It's always in the third person, obviously referring to someone else. Uh, so, in, in conclusion, I want to say that the points that we have discussed here tonight are very important. We ask, is Jesus a man, a, a myth, or is he God? And I've said that we agree that he's a man. We also agree that in the popular sense of the term myth, Jesus is not a myth. He actually existed in history. When it comes to the other meaning of myth, the academic meaning, I, in our discussion, a lot of things came up. For example, the change of the crucifixion date to represent Jesus as the Passover lamb, uh, which is mythical. The idea that Jesus dies for the sins of the world and so on. And then finally, I have laid good ground to show that there are clear statements in the New Testament indicating that Jesus is not God, the clearest one being Mark chapter 13, verse number 32, which shows that he is not omniscient. And I would beg Andy to interpret the rest of the Bible in the light of the clear statements. That's the basic hermeneutics 101, and that uh, obscure statements should be interpreted in the light of the clear. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just uh, get set up here. Okay, fantastic. So five minutes. Well, I'm glad that we've spent most of our uh, time this evening as we've thought about Jesus talking about the Bible and uh, not the Quran. Let me begin my comments there because, of course, the Quran can't help us here. Let me illustrate what I mean, actually, with a little thought experiment. Imagine that in AD 1300, back in the Middle Ages, 700 years after Muhammad, uh, in France, a man appears who speaks no Arabic. Uh, he's only Parisian French. He's never read the Quran. Uh, he's never read the Sirah. He's never read the Hadith. And he begins telling Muslims that they've got Muhammad entirely wrong and they should follow his interpretation of Islam. 
Nobody would take that seriously for a moment, and that's why, as Bartim and the uh, biblical scholar and atheist says, that's why nobody takes the Quran seriously for understanding Jesus. We also must be reminded as well that, of course, Islam is not actually related to Judaism or Christianity, but is actually an entirely different worldview. For sure, it has borrowed terminology, but out of that has built something unique. In fact, many scholars are now beginning to use the term creolization uh, to describe Islam, comparing it to how, for example, uh, Haitian Creole languages took the French vocabulary, bolted on an entirely different grammar and syntax, with the result that now what is spoken in Haitian Creole sounds like French, but it isn't. As the linguist and historian Dr. Mark Dury explains, he says the relationship of the Quran to the Bible is like that of a Creole language to its superstrate, such as, for example, the relationship between Haitian Creole and French. A great many similarities can be readily observed, but the deeper meanings and structures of the Creole are not French. Similarly, Islam's genesis, as reflected in the nature of its foundational scripture, the Quran, did not come about by a process of organic development out of Christianity, Judaism, or even a form of Jewish Christianity instead of the Quran is the outcome of a uniquely creative process, the genesis of an entirely new religion. And the difference there is shown by the fact that throughout the whole of early Christian history, every Christian group that we know of, Jesus was worshipped. In fact, the problem was never that Jesus was divine. That was never the problem. The problem at times was how to make sense of his humanity. As Raymond Brown put it, he said, all scripture texts assume that Jesus knew who he was and acted with sovereign authority. And as we have seen, this goes back to Jesus himself, who in dozens of ways demonstrated his identity. And for Shabir, for Shabir simply to go, well, he can't have been God, so he can't have meant, he meant that. He must have meant anything other than being God is simply a gross misreading of the text. The earliest Christology is very high, very Jewish, and comes from Jesus. Now, in their book, Putting Jesus in His Place, Robert Bowman and J. Ed Komazewski offer a helpful acrostic to help remind us, and for you guys to take away, why Jesus and the early Christians who worshipped him thought that he belonged to the identity of God. We can use the acrostic HANDS, A-H-A-N-D-S. H, Jesus uh, received, uh, Jesus is honoured, the honour uh, like, like God received in Judaism went to Jesus. He was worshipped all across early Christianity in the New Testament and this goes back to Jesus himself. A is for attributes. Jesus is regularly described with God's attributes, creator of all things, ruler of all things, and Jesus believed that he could forgive people, uh, save people, that he was Lord of the Sabbath, and so on. N is for name. God's name is directly applied to Jesus, Philippians 2, and so forth, and Jesus himself actually applies it when he uses the Greek form of Yahweh and applies it to himself in passages like John 8:58. D is for deeds. Jesus does the things that God said he would do. Perhaps most famously in Luke 19 verse 44, Jesus claims that he is embodying in his ministry this long hoped for return of Yahweh to his people. And lastly, S is for seat. According to Jesus himself and according to the early Christians, uh, Jesus ascended to sit on Yahweh's throne in heaven. But in closing, let me add a final S, saves. You know, we all need a saviour because all of us are sinful human beings. I certainly am. Shabir certainly is. Each of us here is separated from God by our rebelliousness and our self-centeredness. Even Muhammad struggled with his sin. We read in the Hadith that Muhammad would pray, O oh Allah, wash away my sins with the water of snow and hail. Cleanse my heart from all sins as a white garment is cleansed from the filth, and so forth. We all need a saviour. But saving is, of course, God's prerogative. Only God can save. And thus, in conclusion, I am so grateful to Jesus, who is not just my Lord, who, I'm, who I worship as 2,000 Christ 2, years of Christians have done throughout history, but he is also my saviour, he is also my friend, who has offered me salvation, turned my life around, and can turn yours around too. Thank you for listening. So patiently encourage you to download my slides with all of the quotes and the references uh, up on the website later on, and you can revisit this at your leisure. It's been a pleasure being with you this evening. Thank you.